is Smithfield. Today, of course, it's famous as a meat market. But 600 years ago, it literally was a field just outside London. Then, on the 15th of June, 1381, it became the stage for one of the most significant events in British history. The climax of an extraordinary fortnight that saw ordinary British working men and women rise up and claim their own place in history for the very first time. It was called the Peasants' Revolt, an event that saw people daring to challenge the rigid rules of medieval society. To rebel in 14th century Britain was to risk everything. And with the stakes so high, this tale involves scenes more bloody than the market scene ever since. The 14th century has been called the world's worst century. It was a terrible time to live. On top of plague, famine and continual wars, there was oppression from the harshest of regimes. When they could bear it no more, the people's response shook the nation to its core. The Peasants' Revolt wasn't a riot, it was a revolution. Its impact was so shocking that historians from the ruling class deliberately hushed up its true significance. They hid the achievements of ordinary people by scorning them as rioting yokels. I want to restore the men and women who stood here to their rightful place in history. I want to bring a whole cast of unknown heroes blinking into the limelight. And with the help of experts, I want to show how oppressed people organised to transform their world and how betrayal and tragedy shattered that dream. Uncovering the truth about the Peasants' Revolt means embarking on an epic journey of discovery. What the Peasants did in 1381 does echo down the centuries to us and it does have a resonance in terms of our own experience today. It's the most important event in the social history of the English Middle Ages. It set the pattern for later centuries of revolt. In retracing the course of the revolution, I'll be finding out just who some of these extraordinary men and women were, and how exactly they managed the planning and logistics of their remarkable campaign. What they never told me at school was that it all started where I come from. I'm an Essex boy, me. When I was growing up here in the 1950s, already there was ribbon development virtually from East Ham to South End on Sea, but it was very different in the Middle Ages. All the places that I knew in my childhood, Walthamstow and Woodford and Barking and Brentwood, they were just little villages. And I'm rather proud to say that it was the men and women of those villages who masterminded and led the Peasants' Revolt. Politicians today talk about the fight for the hearts and minds of Essex man. Well, in 1381, they definitely lost it. The politicians of the time were taking, as they now say around here, a diabolical liberty. It was May 1381, and the English had been clobbered by a new tax. The Hundred Years' War with the French was dragging on, and it was really expensive. So in order to pay for it, they brought in a poll tax, which meant that every adult in the country had to pay the same amount, whether they were the 14th century equivalent of a Jag owner or the proud possessor of a Ford Fiesta. Margaret Thatcher's community charge was nicknamed the poll tax because it was based on the same principle, and 600 years later, it still didn't seem fair. But it wasn't the tax itself that started the revolt. At first, people seemed to be paying. The trouble began when the government did its sums. There was a shortfall. All over the country, people had been dodging the new tax by dropping off the official registers. In Essex, over a third of the population disappeared. If the authorities had turned a blind eye to the tax evasion, then the problem could have been avoided. But they decided to send commissioners in to chase up the defaulters. And what really sent people over the edge was the brutal, deeply personal way that these commissioners behaved. They go into a village and really start chucking their weight about. What caused most offence was the way they treated village women. 
These tax officials would stick their hands up young women's skirts to find out if they were virgins or if they were married and therefore eligible to pay the poll tax. The Peasants' Revolt was sparked by this kind of outrageous behaviour. And the man who put a stop to all this was a baker, Thomas Baker, from the village of Fobbing on the Essex coast. What we know about Thomas Baker was that he was brave. The chronicles say that no one dared to make the first move for fear that they would suffer irrevocable harm. But Thomas Baker had the courage to organise a deputation from surrounding villages and confront the commissioner at Brentwood. The commissioner's name was John Bampton. On the 30th of May, he pitched up at Brentwood with only a token bodyguard, blissfully unaware of what lay in store. Bampton set up a makeshift table in the middle of the village and all around him there were angry people jostling, lots of people from the surrounding villages. It was a really ugly mood and out of it stepped Thomas Baker and he said to Bampton, all of these folk have already paid their taxes. There's no way you're going to get a penny more out of them. And Bampton immediately ordered the arrest of a hundred people in the crowd. That certainly wasn't going to happen. He'd completely misjudged their mood. A riot started and Bampton's men had to flee before they were beaten up. No one knew it at the time, but that was the start of the Peasants' Revolt. And it was a baker that started it. I'd never even thought of bakers as peasants, but Thomas the Baker had a very firm place in a social order that had been fixed for centuries. And to understand the Peasants' Revolt, you have to know where everyone stood in the pecking order. No, you're right, this isn't rural Essex. I've driven all the way down from Brentwood to Penarth in South Wales, down the M4, which is a heck of a drive, I can tell you in order to see if I could get something of a feel of what medieval barking and Billericay and Dagnum would have been like at this reconstructed village. To our untutored eyes, these uh, buildings all seem pretty much the same, even though that's a barn, that belongs to the pig man, this one over here is the baker's house. Thomas Baker would probably have lived somewhere like this, but they all knew what their place was in this very close-knit hierarchy. For instance, Inside the baker's house, it all looks pretty impoverished. In fact, the baker had got all he needed to survive. What made his life a misery was that he was officially a serf. He could own land and property, but he still belonged to the lord of the manor. Serfdom meant he couldn't move or work for anyone else or even marry his daughter off without permission. Even the top man in the village, the reeve, was bound by the same system. He had plenty of space, lots of possessions, nice furniture, a few acres to farm. He was like a successful small businessman, but he was still thought of as a peasant because he was under the control of the lord of the manor. Nevertheless, everything ticked along quite nicely, as long as there was plenty of food on the table. But then, in the middle of the 14th century, something happened that changed all that. In 1348, the Black Death swept into Britain. There was no cure. Communities such as these were devastated. The Black Death killed up to half of all the people in Europe. To put that into some kind of context, we all know of someone who was killed in the First or Second World War. But if you add up all the people killed in the World Wars, in Bosnia, in the civilian massacres of Hitler and Stalin, it still only comes to 3.7% of the European population. If you wanted to duplicate the effect of the Black Death on Europe, you'd have to have 20 World Wars. Well, in many ways, the Black Death was a disaster for many peasant communities. Uh, lots of village communities were completely destroyed, whole communities were obliterated. And the Black Death is seen as a kind of punishment visited by God on mankind for its sinfulness. But if you're lucky enough to survive the 
uh, onslaught of the plague, then great opportunities unfolded for you. What kind of opportunities? Well, there was plenty of land available. Land had been short before the Black Death. In the wake of the Black Death, there's a superabundance of it. And also, wages begin to rise really quite dramatically. So you could be much more mobile? You could be more mobile, and also you could hope to earn a great deal more. You're, you're, and, and the consumer power of the peasantry is growing in this period. So how did the employers cope with this shortage of labour? Well, they tried to buck the market, essentially. The government, acting on their behalf, introduces legislation to restrict the movement of labour and also restrict wage levels. Um, and this obviously produces considerable tension and discontent. And then this huge tax gets dumped on people? Yes. A, a series of, of, of pressures are building within the peasant community, within the peasant economy. You've got restrictive legislation coming from the centre, and on top of this you've also got a novel form of tax, the like of which has never been seen before. King Richard II was only 14 when the revolt started. People didn't blame him for the oppression and chaos. They believed the king was divinely appointed and trusted him implicitly. The only problem was that he was young. You couldn't expect a little kid to rule on his own, so when things started to go from bad to worse, people began to blame his advisers, who seemed to be doing pretty nicely out of all the disasters. The most hated figure was John of Gaunt, the king's uncle. He helped institute the poll tax. People suspected him of siphoning off funds for his own use. And joining Gaunt on the peasants' most hated list were two churchmen, Archbishop of Canterbury Simon Sudbury, who was Chancellor of England, and the Treasurer Robert Hales. Together, they were responsible for organising the get-tough collection of the poll tax. Cup of tea, please, mate. Yeah. Uh, take away, please. No. It wasn't unusual in the Middle Ages for churchmen to hold down top political and economic jobs, and it wasn't unusual for them to carry on their duties in a pretty unchristian way. But Sudbury and Hales made loan sharks today seem like the Salvation Army. The fact that the commissioners were so extraordinarily heavy handed was completely down to them. A little bacon roll as well? Yeah, no problem. What amazes me is why people didn't snap sooner. They've had the plague, they've had landlords trying to force down their wages, they've had to pay for wars in France with an unfair tax, which always seems to end up in the nobility's pockets. But commissioners sexually assaulting their women, that pushed them over the edge. The peasants' revolt had started when Thomas the Baker's men had kicked out the tax commissioners from Brentwood. The backlash came almost immediately. The next day, another tax officer turned up in Brentwood with a small troop of soldiers to calm the crowd and quell the riot, but they completely underestimated the strength of popular feeling. It was dangerous to rebel against a king's representative, but these were people who'd passed the point of no return. They didn't care that they were committing treason. For the first time, the rebellion turned violent. Six of the king's men were beheaded, the rest fled. The rebels had crossed a line. There was no going back. The English nobility saw the people who worked for them as little more than savages. But within a few days, these people would organize a revolt with a specific agenda and carry it out with ruthless efficiency. Thomas the Baker from Fobbing had lit the torch of freedom. Within a matter of days, it would engulf the land in fire. When an angry crowd beheaded the king's tax collectors at Brentwood, they kicked off other outbreaks of violence and unrest. Rioting swiftly spread across Essex and beyond. 
Four days later, anger at the poll tax exploded in Kent. This is Thamesmead on the south side of the Thames. At first glance, you wouldn't imagine that it's crawling with history. But it was here that the Peasants' Revolt stopped being just a bunch of riots over a long, hot summer and started to become something much more like a military campaign. Just down the road is the rebels' first major target. Lesness Abbey. Now, you may think it's a pretty soft target and a million miles away from the poll tax, but in fact, abbeys like this one own the vast majority of the land in England, and the abbots who ran them were like the managing directors of financial institutions. Not only that, but they were employers, so all the tax records would have been in there. These tax rebels were led by a man called Abel Kerr from Erith, a nearby port on the Thames. Abel brought his men here and surrounded the abbey. Faced with an angry mob of peasants and fearing for the monastery in his life, the abbot surrendered. With limited resources, Abel had secured his first victory. Then he went across the river into Essex and tried to mobilise men there, picked up a hundred men in Barking, brought them back to here and continued the mayhem. But, Mike, when I was a kid on the borders of London and Essex, we never went south of the river. I think the first time I ever went was when I went on holiday to Folkestone when I was about 12. Wouldn't it have been the same then? No, quite the opposite. In the 14th century, there was a tremendous estuary culture. The Thames here was full of boats plying to and fro between Essex and Kent. The only land crossing was London Bridge down the river there. But here, tremendous agricultural region in Kent, tremendous agricultural region in Essex, produce, livestock, people, trade, hundreds of boats to and fro. But Mike, Abel went to barking and back here in a flash. Yeah, I think there are a lot of the logistics of this rebellion and a lot of issues to do with medieval travel that we need to explore and experiment with. Undoubtedly, he must have used horses. Mm. See, one of the things about the Chronicles is that they're great at telling us what happened, but absolutely useless in telling us how it happened. So we've brought Mike in as Mr. How It Happened, and your first challenge is to work out how Abel and his horsemen would have crossed the river. Do you think you can do that? Certainly, I will don the mantle of the rebels and, and represent their journey through this uprising. So while Mike starts the business of retracing one part of the revolt with Abel Kerr, I'm heading back north of the river. Because what made the revolt so confusing for the authorities was that it was springing up all over the place before they had time to react. Essex was the birthplace of the revolt and events there were moving at breakneck speed. At exactly the same time as Abel Kerr and his men were surrounding Lessness Abbey in Kent, the ringleaders and founders of the rebellion were launching their manifesto here at Bocking in Essex. The chronicles at the time dismissed the peasants as disorganised rabble. But the summit held here on the 2nd of June 1381 provides a vital clue to the true nature of the revolt. They weren't just a bunch of troublemakers. The agenda was put together by leading, respected members of their communities who thought they were being really patriotic by defending traditional rights. On the 2nd of June, they declared their intention to destroy divers' lieges of the king, which means to get rid of Sudbury and Gaunt and those they thought were corrupting the king, and to have no laws in England, only those that they themselves moved to be ordained. This was dynamite, the assertion that people could actually rule themselves. And they made sure that everyone was going to hear that message. They sent messages out into the surrounding villages. These people were well organised, weren't they? They were organised, certainly around areas like Colchester, which was the heart of the Great Society. And we think in villages all around the southeast of England, there would have been a, a nucleus of radicals who'd been organising for some time. So do you reckon that there were radical cells dotted all over the country, which all kind of keyed in to this feeling of revolt? 
certainly in the South East and the counties around London, uh, if you look at the rhymes and the coded messages that were sent out... They sent out coded messages? They did send out coded messages, that's right. Well, I, I have one here. Can, can I read yeah, it yeah, to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And, um, th th this is a good example uh, of one of the surviving messages. These, these, by the way, were found in the pockets of rebels. Um, but here's one, I'll read it briefly. John Shep, sometime St Mary Priest of York, and now in Colchester, greeteth well John Nameless, and John Miller, and John Carter, and biddeth Piers Plowman to go to his work and chastise well Hob the Robber. I didn't understand a word of that. What's it mean? Well, they're cryptically written, and we have to interpret from the Middle English. Now, if I can just translate quickly. Yes, please do. <laughs> Um, John Shep, John the Shepherd, that, that's a New Testament reference. Sometimes St. Some, some Mary, priest of York, that refers to John Ball, who was an important leader of the rebellion, who, who was excommunicated, hence sometime. Greeteth well, John Nameless, every man, ordinary folk, and John Miller and John Carter, these are tradespeople, working people, and biddeth Pierce Plowman to go to his work and chastise well Hob the Robber. Hob the Robber was the nickname of Robert Hales. He was the treasurer uh, for the government. He was a hated, a hated figure. We have to understand here that uh, one of the causes of the rebellion was a hatred of taxation. Mm. This was a, an anti-poll tax rebellion on a grand scale. And this is a very specific instruction. Chastise him well. This is a deadly instruction. They know what they're saying. The meaning's very clear. Messages imply that you can read, that you know what's going on on a national scale, that there's some kind of network that you can take the messages to. How come people were so well briefed and so organised? I think in every village there would have been somebody who could read, who would have been educated at the, at the local abbey. They would have relied on um, somebody standing on a little tussock or up on a barrel, reading out the coded messages, um, interpreting them for the audience. Uh, but, you know, I think you have to understand uh, communication in terms of the technology and the, uh, the, the society of the day. In, in the same way as today, uh, anti-globalisation protesters rely on, on the internet uh, or on email. Uh, in, in the 60s, people listened to their tranny radios for the latest news of the latest demonstration. Well, back in 1381, that's how people did it. So, the, I think, although the, the technology changes, uh, the sense of excitement and exhilaration at the latest piece of information or the latest story from London is kind of the same. It's the same um, feeling of being in a movement, the same feeling of liberation, the same feeling of excitement and not quite knowing what's going to happen next, but knowing that you want to be involved. These messages were shooting out from Essex in all directions to signal the start of the revolt. This explains why the south of England seems to spontaneously combust in the summer of 1381. And that brings us back to our own medieval traveller. Mike Lodes is on the first stage of a journey that will take him through Kent and eventually to London. But first, like Abel Kerr, he has to get across the Thames. He's asked me to meet him at Tilbury Docks, which doesn't sound very medieval. Mike, I know this place. My granddad used to work down here when I was a kid. He was a steward on a boat exactly like that for the Union Castle Line. So, surely that's your answer. We get the horses on there and take them across. Well, far from being the answer, it's ships like that that are our problem. In what way? During the last few centuries, the Thames has been dredged into a deep channel. And that has made it much wider and a much stronger current. It's more tidal because of boats like that. In the 14th century, it would have been a narrower, gentler, much easier crossing. OK, so the Abbey's burning on the other bank. Abel Kerr's come over here to get some men from Essex to go back to Kent. How does he get across? How does he get the horses across? Well, I've been looking into it. My first thought, well, the answer is going to be a Thames wherry because that's a, a traditional Thames cargo craft. And what we found out was that they're not deep enough and we'd have to tack a lot to get across there and the boom wouldn't clear the horses' heads. So that was out. And I thought, maybe some kind of barge. But then we've got issues of loading them and getting them down, and the jetties aren't in place. So would there have been much traffic along here during the 14th century, or would it have been pretty... Stop that. Pretty uh, <laughs> empty like it is now. I'm sure it would have been colossal, because don't forget, at this time, the only bridge across the Thames was London Bridge, and that's miles upriver. So I'm sure they were plying to and fro all the time with cattle and sheep and produce. OK, so if we haven't got a roll-on, roll-off ferry, what are we going to do? Well, 
it is so tidal, it is so choppy, it would be too dangerous for the horses. So I've decided to try my luck and take them on the Tilbury Passenger Ferry. I'm not sure this one's too happy about it. No, I know, but I'm taking two along with me because I've got a long ride now. We're going down to Canterbury and riding back and we need a relay of horses. So I'm going to try and get these two onto the ferry. Six days into the revolt, Abel Kerr headed back to Kent with a hundred men from Essex. He landed in Dartford. Two days later, Abel, boosted with reinforcements, launched the first rebel strike on a major military target. They moved from Dartford onto Rochester. A week after the start of the revolt, the peasants had the confidence to attack one of the best defended fortresses in the land. Rochester Castle had a fearsome reputation. The peasants risked everything just to free a serf from the dungeons. There was a chap called Robert Belling who'd been living in Gravesend for some time and one of the king's knights turned up and said, Oi, I recognise you. You're one of my runaway serfs. You're my property. I want you back. And Belling said, I'm not. And a big dispute broke out. And while they were waiting to decide who was right, Belling was banged up here in Rochester Castle. The local people were absolutely furious. It became a cause celeb. On the 6th, the rioters from Dartford turned up here and surrounded the castle. Now, look at this place. It's purpose-built to withstand a siege. When King John arrived here in the year 1215, it took siege engines and tunnels before the castle surrendered. But the Dartford men arrived and the doors opened. There must have been a heck of a lot of support for them, both outside the castle and inside. At the heart of each of these momentous events were individual men and women. And amazingly, 600 years later, we know who some of them were. The Peasants' Revolt wasn't just about the workers. There were all sorts. Ordinary blokes like soldier Thomas Wooden, He'd been paid 30 pounds up front to sail for France with the army. But he jumped ship at Dartford and joined the rebels storming Rochester Castle. You'd never call Sir Thomas Raven a peasant. Even though he was an MP and the bailiff of Rochester Castle, he was an enthusiastic supporter of the revolt. But the man who emerged as overall leader was a tradesman. We know that because his name has echoed down the centuries. I don't remember much from my school, but one name that sticks in my head, probably sticks in yours too, is Watt Tyler. When the revolt started, there were lots of local leaders, but when they got here to Maidstone, they elected one national leader, Watt, which was short for Walter, and he really was a Tyler, probably worked on the roofs of abbeys and churches, that kind of thing. Other than that, we know virtually nothing about him. Some say he was a local radical, others that he was from Dartford or even Essex. But it was here that he came to the fore in Maidstone where he was elected leader and where he helped to rescue another of the leading lights of the revolt, John Ball, who was being held as a prisoner in the Archbishop's Palace, which is now a registry office. Watt Tyler and his men wrecked the palace and broke open the jail, freeing John Ball and the other prisoners. Why on earth would an archbishop have a prison? Oh, I suppose it all turns really on, on our understanding what an archbishop is in the late 14th century and thinking that an archbishop is a really a powerful prince. The chief vicar. Uh, yes, yeah, I, and, and, and the, none greater than the Archbishop of Canterbury. And having two major domains which he's going to uh, use a prison for people who uh, fall foul of his ecclesiastical courts, and he's going to use it for...
um, people who um, have offended in his local manners, which he, over his vast estates, and are going to be brought here for, to be jailed in, at the same time. What was John Ball doing in prison? Well, John Ball is in prison because he is acting as a, a radical preacher, um, and it seems he's been in prison three or four times, and that he's brought in each time for um, operating as a preacher without license, and also because the text of his sermons and, and the text of his teaching is radically undermining of the traditional authority of the church in England. In what way is he a radical? He's a radical because he, he wishes to reform the church from within uh, in terms of its care for the poor and the sick and the distribution of arms. Um, and he's a radical um, because he wishes to go back fundamentally um, to the way the church was long ago. He's symptomatic of, uh, of new attitudes among the clergy. Was it just John Ball they rescued? John Ball is just one among many prisoners at that time. We probably ought to give more importance to those other prisoners, people who are local rebels in the Archbishop's courts, but also those who, from the 1370s, despite the fact that they could be retained and taken into warfare in northern France, actually refused to do that. And it's quite clear that the area around Maidstone, and indeed Tunbridge, was an area of a hotbed for that kind of ref those kind of refuseniks, if you like, those kind of people who would not fight. Even as late as May um, in 1381, militia groups were being raised in Kent, and each of those militia groups had its own leader, and a little band of potential fighters who were being raised to fight against the French and the Castilians. It's immediately a recruiting ground, of course, for the peasant revolt. Twelve days in, the peasants' revolt had become a crusade. The rebels were organised. They had a manifesto and were using targeted violence to achieve their aims. After destroying the Archbishop's prison, they headed off for Simon Sudbury's HQ, 30 miles away in Canterbury. He was the chief poll tax enforcer and the rebels wanted his blood. They marched into Canterbury on the morning of the 10th, joined up with the local people, rooted out and executed all those who were identified as traitors, and then pitched up here at the cathedral. They burst in and completely disrupted High Mass, which would have been deeply offensive in itself, then demanded the removal of Archbishop Sudbury and that John Bull should be put in his place. None of these chairs would have been here. This whole area would have been one vast open space with the people completely cut off from the priests by that choir screen over there. But the rebels ignored all that. They marched straight in. This whole place, which would have been so quiet normally, would suddenly have been full of angry voices and people demanding that Archbishop Sudbury come in front of them. The whole thing must have seemed like complete anarchy. But of course Sudbury wasn't here. He was far too shrewd a political animal. He was up in London, not in his abbey church. But they'd gone too far to give up now. Instead, they launched a lightning strike on London. What would happen when this tidal wave of angry peasants reached the capital? After only 12 days of the peasants' revolt, a carefully ordered medieval world had been blown apart. Most of southern England was beyond the rule of law. In search of an end to unfair taxes and serfdom, the rebels had broken open jails and invaded the headquarters of the church, Canterbury Cathedral. Then the chronicles tell us they embarked on a daring strategy to attack the capital itself. The stories seem scarcely possible, so we're going to put them to the test. After the raid on the cathedral, we're told that the rebels set off en masse for London on the morning of the 11th, and that 60,000 of them turned up at Blackheath on the outskirts of the capital the following evening. But that seems a heck of a long way to go for such a large crowd in such a short time. So Mike and his team are going to put the chronicles to the test and see how easy it would have been to have done that march in, what, 36 hours? We know they went from Canterbury via Maidstone because they kicked off a lot of trouble there. So that means that they were actually going in a bit of a curve? A little bit of a curve, not straight up the A2. So we're going to follow a similar route, but we are obviously going to have to wiggle a bit because we can't take these main roads with the horses. 
think at least some of us might get there. We're certainly going to give it a go. Would you like to give it a go with us? I am probably the world's worst horseman. <laughs> but? I'll give it a go. Splendid. I think you ought to wear this. Oh, would you help me on with it? I will. We've got a wonderful horse for you called Milano. And she'll make you look good. She's very steady and very good. And you're just going to have to sit there and grit your teeth and put up with the pain. I'll look cool. You promise me? Oh, yeah. This is Milano? This is Milano. Hello, mate. Hello. Oh, I haven't done this for a long time. Got my leg up. Oh, can't get it put in. We want to establish if 60,000 peasants really could get to London in a day and a half. OK, let's go to London. We're giving ourselves every advantage. Although most of the peasants would have been on foot, we're using the fastest mode of medieval transport. We've got changes of horses lined up and the advantage of 21st century planning and communications. But there are some obstacles the medieval peasants wouldn't have had. What kind of surface do you reckon these roads would have had in the 14th century? Well, I think one, once we're out of the precincts, it, it would have been dirt roads. Yeah. Because it's, that's what's all the transport was horse transport, and that is much kinder to horses. It's not to make a noise, this, doesn't it? Well, I think noise stress is going to be one of our most tiring factors. Yeah. One thing's certain, the medieval peasant must have had a hardier bottom than me. After an hour or so, I was starting to suffer, and then disaster struck. Right, this is what happened. We rode along for about an hour, and then I had to stop for a bit, because I had to get off and do a bit of filming. And they rode on because they were already late, and they needed to catch up time. And by the time I finished filming, we couldn't find them. And so we've been looking for them ever since. And we've lost radio contact and we've lost telephone contact. And I'm stuck here with all the film crew. We've got to be here because we've got to swap over the horses because nowadays with animal welfare, you can't ride the same set of horses for the whole 36 hours. And we've completely lost the rest of the riders. And in a funny sort of way, maybe this is what it would have been like in small communities along the way, not knowing what was going on. So perhaps, inadvertently, we've recaptured the whole spirit of the Peasants' Revolt. On the other hand, maybe we've just fouled up. But this enforced separation gave me the chance to investigate an equally important part of the revolt elsewhere. At school, what you learn about is the peasants marching from Canterbury. But that's not even half the story. North of the Thames, thousands of peasants from hundreds of villages were forming the second arm of the coordinated pincer movement, threatening to crush London. People from all over East Anglia had joined the Essex rebels. Men like John Sumner from Manningtree near Ipswich. We know he owned 400 marks worth of goods. That's over £130,000 today. His neighbour, Robert Pierce, was also a rich landowner. Both were totally unlike a caricature of a peasant. Pierce and Sumner joined 40 others from their village. The focus of their anger was still the injustice of the poll tax. Along the road, the Manning Tree men united with others. Their road to London was marked by a carefully targeted campaign of violence. Their first stop was here, at Coggleshall in Essex, headquarters of the chief tax collector for Essex. This is his house here. They yanked him out of his window, beheaded him in the street and stuck his head on a pole. Then they ransacked the whole house looking for the hated green-sealed poll tax documents, which they destroyed. They might be able to replace the tax collector, but how would they know who to tax? Then the rebels headed five miles down the road to the Manor of the Knights Hospitaller at Cressing Temple. This was the order run by the poll tax villain, Robert Hales. They were joined there by others from all over the county who'd chosen the manor as a rendezvous point. And incredibly, the enormous barns are still standing. These were people who lived in hovels and little cottages and were used to buildings the size of small parish churches. 
This was architecture designed by the enemy. And it wouldn't have been empty like it is today. It would have been jam-packed from floor to ceiling with peas and beans and corn and barley. And where would the profits have gone? Not to the local people. It would have all gone to the headquarters of the Knights Hospitaller in Malta. And there wasn't just one of these things. There was another one just as big right there. They must have really hacked the local people off. So why didn't they burn them down? The answer is because they were country folk. What they did set fire to was over there, behind those walls, the offices and the kitchens and the refectory of the monks. As far as country folk were concerned, these were useless. But these were seriously useful. Do you think that they did an enormous amount of damage when they were here? Yeah, they must have done an enormous amount of damage. Um, at the time, for, there was uh, um, stored uh, food and, and wine for the general chapter of the Knights Hospitallers by order of Robert Hales. And apparently the rebels ate all the food and drank all the wine. Uh, the chronicle, says, a chronicle account says it was three casks of wine, which is three barrels or the equivalent of 90 to 100 gallons and 450 liters. That is quite a lot. And uh, they were quite fortified when they uh, sat on their way. Was this the only place associated with Hales that got attacked? No, quite a few manors of the Knights Hospitallers were attacked in, in Lincolnshire and Leicestershire, uh, three places in Cambridge, uh, places in London besides Clerkenwell, uh, the manor of Highbury. So it was a deliberate attack on the manors of the Knights uh, Hospitallers and on Robert Hales himself. How many people do you reckon turned up here? we can uh, be sure that at least 110 people from 50 different parishes, villages all over Essex turned up, and one person from North Fleet in Kent, interestingly. Presumably, if 110 got charged, there must have been more than that here. Yes, I, I, I guess so, too. Uh, it's very tricky to find, uh, to know something about the true number of, of, but it must have been several hundreds who came together here on the morning of the 10th of June. After destroying Cressing Temple, the Essex rebels started their advance on London. By nightfall on the 11th, they were burning tax documents in Chelmsford. Meanwhile, south of the Thames, the other arm of the pincer movement was still pressing on the capital. What Tyler and his men were making camp on the first night of the march from Canterbury to London, somewhere around Maidstone. Mike's made good progress following the same route. Without foot soldiers to hold him up, he's pushed five miles beyond Maidstone. But it's taken him all day. Oh. How are you, Mike? Actually, surprisingly good. Surprisingly good. Right. It's, it's been a long old day. They couldn't have done the same distance that we've done today on foot. I think people on foot, just keeping a steady pace, would probably be only four or five hours behind. And obviously as they're coming along, they're gathering fresh people as they come. So not everybody's going to be as foot sore as the others. You want to go to bed, don't you? Let's go on. But it's already 10 o'clock at night. So foot soldiers lagging four or five hours behind would have had a hell of a distance to make up. Already, the idea that 60,000 peasants moved en masse through Kent is beginning to look implausible. With twin peasant armies converging on London, the city was gripped with rumour and panic. The boy King Richard and his court, including his hated advisers, beat a swift retreat from Westminster to the Tower of London. Why was the King holed up in the Tower? Didn't he have all the resources of the Crown available to him? Well, the King and his chief ministers, um, Archbishop Sudbury and Lord Treasurer Hales, have had to take to the Tower for his own security because of the reports that are reaching him of the sheer scale of the disturbances around London and the South East. We've got to remember that at this time there's no standing police force and there's no national standing army. The professional soldiers of the Crown are actually at the moment fighting in France um, where they need it and so Richard has only a limited number of men at his disposal at this time. Okay, so he's outnumbered in here. What are they planning to do? 
Well, clearly Richard and his ministers have got to come up with some kind of strategy to get the rebels out of London. But he's a 14-year-old boy. Well, it's remarkable how Richard's ministers behave like rabbits caught in the headlights and simply have been shocked by this national revolt that they were totally um, unprepared for. And so the young king seems to be the person who has to call the shots himself. How easy would it have been for the rebels to break in here? Well, what we see now is some of the most state-of-the-art defences of late medieval England. The tower was an exceptionally well-defended building. In the 14th century, there would have been even more perimeter defences than what we see now. And so, if the garrison had been wanting to put up a stiff fight, they could have done so with a fairly small number of men. But the problem is that he doesn't have enough men to take the fight out of the tower and take on the rebels, who are much superior in numbers. So he's OK as long as he's here, but there's nothing else that he can do? Absolutely. He's got to sit tight. The king could only wait for information. Meanwhile, the rebels were pressing steadily on from Canterbury. On the second day of their journey, Mike and his men have put on a spurt, thanks to some authentic medieval technology. They've swapped horses. These specialist Icelandic ponies are as close as we can get to the medieval horses called amblers. Mike! Tony! Relief to see you, I thought you were lost. Well, yeah, it's been quite a leg of journey, this one. We've done about 18 miles. And look at these, they're fresh and sprightly. These are not the horses you started out with, mate. No, they shrunk a bit, haven't they? <laughs> These are Icelandic horses. The significance is not that they're Icelandic, but that Icelandic horses are ones that have kept the lateral gene. In other words, they've got a different type of walk. If I show you, yeah. look how she's going. If she goes along here like this, look how she goes. It's, and I'm not bouncing up and down, because what's happening is her legs are going, these two are going that way, then these two, so it's a side-to-side -side motion. So I'm just gently rolling in the saddle. I haven't got all this action while I'm riding. When you're travelling a long distance, you want comfort. And it's also a good thing for the horses, because what they're doing is not putting the impact directly into the ground. They're running like this. Yeah, because even when we were just trotting on those metal surfaces, because I hadn't ridden for ages, I came away pretty shaken. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're getting that. So yeah. you're getting the... And imagine what it's doing to that part of a horse's leg. Yeah. Now, that wasn't an issue in the Middle Ages because they didn't have metal roads. We've got a problem. The tough little amblers have got Mike within striking distance of their destination, but we can't use them again today, and our original horses are worn out from the day before on the roads. Hour after hour on metal roads, he doesn't do the amble, he does the trot. Yeah, yeah. And there he's getting concussion, and this is... It's not too bad, but the early signs are he's got a little bit of inflammation here. Yeah. Which means today, because I adore this horse, I don't want to push him through any discomfort, so we're going to have to walk now. And, and that hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, well, we know we could have done it, yeah. but we've got to look after the horses first, so I think that's going to slow us down a lot now. We'll just see how far we get. Desperate medieval peasants might have risked their horses, but this is only telly. As Mike hits the suburbs, it's a question of how much further his horse can manage. What do you think? Is he picking his feet up well? I think he's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he's all right. He's sound. He's not, he's, not, he's not yet lame. It's just that if I were to push him, then he might become lame. I'll see you in Blackheath. See you in Blackheath. Over five hours later, I'm waiting for Mike with my own rebel academic. We're on Blackheath, where 60,000 rebels gathered, and it's uh, 12 minutes past eight, and Mike was supposed to be here at five o'clock, and we're losing the light, and it's starting to rain, but at least we've got an authentic campfire. Very nice and warm. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got any tax documents to burn on it, as the rebels would have done in 1381. They did choose a fantastic spot to meet up, though, didn't they? Well, it's nice and open. Nowadays, it's a rather well municipal area. In 1381, it would have been more rough and ready. But the most interesting thing is there would have been direct access back down. Hang on, hang on a minute. Come and have a look at this. 
here. You've got a cab. I'm afraid we got a cab. <laughs> we were expecting the clip clop of three horses about three hours ago. Oh, well done, mate. Well done. Well done. Yeah, about another two hours after we left you. So, probably another eight, ten miles. And then what Lu happened? Well, Louis was. He, I mean, he's not lame, lame, but he was starting to be very gentle on that hoof, and I needed to look after the horse, so I called it a day. Stick yourself down there. But so we didn't kind of make it, but then in a way we did. Well, very much so we did. I mean, we have covered at least the same distance that they did, probably more. Yeah. It's not a big deal for a medieval traveller to have covered that sort of distance on the right sort of horses. Yeah. Mike, it's not a big deal for a medieval traveller on the right kind of horses, but hasn't this really blown out of the water, this idea that thousands of people came up from Kent and Essex? Because you weren't going to have that many horses available. There wasn't going to be that much grub available, surely. I think certainly that, that the idea that um, a single group uh, descended on London from Canterbury is difficult to sustain in the light of this experiment. What fascinates me about it is that it certainly uh, demonstrates the need to use horses and the need to have backup, um, and that's absolutely critical, which seems to me to suggest possibly one's talking about a small group of horse riders who were really going around encouraging others to rise up, coordinating events, and really acting as something of a militant spearhead um, in the move towards London. Um, the, the suggestions that's brought out from this experiment um, seems to be borne out by the judicial records of the proceedings against the rebels, which suggests a similar sort of mix. A few real militant uh, uh, leaders from Kent coming up from Canterbury, presumably horse riding in the same way that you did, with other supporters who joined them as they assembled here on Blackheath. Does that work for you? Oh, it works for me enormously. I mean, I see it as a strike force, as people whipping up the fervour. Those who have the economic ability to do that, travelling horses, but you say small groups, a hundred horsemen, can you, you remember the sound of those amblers, come, three of them coming up, imagine that a hundred times, the dust, the noise, coming into a little village, that was a huge event, and it would have gathered like a snowball, and closer we got to London, more and more people. So the kind of thing that I learnt at school, of thousands and thousands of ignorant peasants marching through the countryside and then ending up in London seems not to be the case but what we can see is the idea of, of flying pickets, smart people, experienced people, people with good horses, just a few of them coming here, meeting up and whipping yeah. everything it's up. A, it's a much more varied, uh, complex uh, picture than, uh, the, than the classic uh, view would lead us to believe. Well, we've got the authentic place, we've got the authentic rebels, we've got the authentic campfire. Uh, I suggest we turn it off and uh, go down the boozer. <laughs> you going for that? Yes. <laughs> North of the Thames, the other rebel army from Essex camped outside the city walls at Mile End. These twin armies had blazed through the countryside. In the capital, people waited in trepidation as peasants from Kent and Essex threatened to change the country for good. The Peasants' Revolt was the most astonishing popular uprising of the Middle Ages. It was a response to a century that was hell to live in. On top of plague, famine and war, the government had imposed a poll tax. In 1381, the people snapped. Within two weeks, a mixture of farmers, tradesmen and landless labourers were on the brink of overthrowing the social order. The rebels had marched on London to present their demands for justice to the boy King Richard II in person. Fifteen days in, and two vast armies from Kent and Essex were camped north and south of the Thames. We've discovered that the rebels who camped here on Blackheath under their leader Wat Tyler weren't just yokels. 
the so-called peasants were highly organized and politically sophisticated. They wanted change and they wanted freedom. Right here on that Thursday morning, on the day of the Catholic feast of Corpus Christi, the rebel clergyman John Ball celebrated mass and preached one of the most famous sermons ever, a political manifesto as radical as Marxism 500 years later. He asked, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? In other words, the very first people that God created weren't gentry, they were ordinary working folk who dug their fields and made their own clothes. The message was clear. The whole system of nobility wasn't ordained by God. In fact, it ran directly counter to God's will. So, with God on their side, the rebels set off to put that right. King Richard and his court had no idea how radical the demands of the rebels were, so they'd got no plan to deal with them. In fact, they had little plan at all they agreed to an arm's length meeting. This is an illustration of what seems to have been an extraordinarily impractical arrangement. The king and his advisers got on barges at the Tower of London and sailed to Rotherhithe to where the peasants were massing. The idea was that they'd have a safe stretch of water between them and the mob. And according to the chronicles, the king told them to go home. Although I can't actually imagine that the king said it himself. Presumably one of the aristocrats said, what should we do, my lord? And the king said, tell them to go home. And the aristocrat went, the king says, go home. But that does seem to be a pretty pathetic tactic. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. This isn't working very well, is it? Hang on. Can you turn the engine off, mate? I said it seems a pretty pathetic tactic to just simply have said, go away. It certainly was, but there's chaos in the king's advisers at this time. His ministers do not really know how to deal with this. They're not quite sure how um, large the revolt has become, and their earlier efforts to send out messengers to try and intercept the rebels and tell them to go home simply hasn't worked. So what did the king do? Well, the king and a small flotilla of barges basically stop in the river and wait for the rebels to shout what they want. And what did they want? The rebels ask, can we meet the king in person? And does he agree? Well, we're not sure exactly what the king wants, but it seems that his ministers say to him, definitely, do not get off the boat. It's not safe. So they try and keep him on the boat. So what did the peasants actually demand? Well, what they ask for now is a list of important men to be handed over for them to deal with themselves. Like who? Well, it reads like a list of the who's who of late medieval England. It's the top men in the king's government, including the chancellor, the treasurer, the lord keeper of the privy seal, and some senior judges who've been involved in prosecuting the men who are refusing to pay the poll tax. So, presumably, some of them would have been in this little flotilla of barges. Well, it seems more than likely that a lot of these men are actually around Richard at the time. So it puts both them and the young king in a difficult situation. So, presumably, he didn't hand them over? No, he doesn't. Probably because he's been stalling for time. And then what does he do? Well, the flotilla simply goes back to the tower. Well, presumably the peasants weren't very happy about that. The peasants are absolutely outraged by this, and they simply decide, well, if the king is not going to come to us, then we are going to come to him and force him to listen to us. And they did. They marched into Southwark and broke open the king's bench jail, freeing the prisoners. Army deserter Thomas Wooten used the opportunity to pinch six silver spoons belonging to the jailer's wife. But the revolt had popular support across all classes. The rebels were joined by respectable local citizens, like John Mocking. He'd made a fortune importing wine for wealthy Londoners. He was a leading member of the congregation at St Olaf's, where his brother was rector. London's last line of defence was the Thames. In 1381, there was only one place to cross, London Bridge. 
By putting pillars of the community like John Mocking at the front of the crowd, the rebels persuaded the aldermen defending London Bridge to lower the drawbridge. The peasant army swept across the bridge and into the defenceless city. Presumably going to follow round and get over that way. I've only got a token force, but we're following the exact route the rebels took. As they flooded into the city and out onto Fleet Street, it must have been like an invading army. Many Londoners supported the revolt and turned out to welcome the peasants. But there was fear and panic too, as the peasants started to hunt down their targets. They didn't just hate the priests and the nobility, they loathed the lawyers, especially the corrupt ones who rigged trials in favour of the rich. So when they arrived at the courts of justice, they burst in, dragged out the lawyers and cut their heads off. These were tough countrymen with their own idea of rough justice. There was no mercy for the people they believed had betrayed the king. And the chief traitor in their eyes was John of Gaunt, the king's uncle. The rebels believed he was the evil power behind the throne, pushing the young king into making all the wrong decisions and getting rich himself. Lucky for him, Gaunt was on the Scottish border when the peasant struck, or he would have been a dead man. Instead, the peasants vented their anger on his palace at the Savoy. Where the Savoy Hotel stands now was one of the grandest palaces in the kingdom. It was a storehouse for Gaunt's wealth, a treasure trove of jewels, exquisite furniture, robes, finery and cash, which the people believed had been siphoned off from the poll tax. Around four o'clock on the afternoon of the 13th of June, it became the chief target for all the pent-up hatred and passion of the peasants' revolt. They came bursting in here, raced into the palace, smashing everything up, tearing up clothes. They got arrows which they set fire to and then they fired the arrows into the clothes. It would have been absolute chaos in here. Hiya. Uh, can we uh, ride our horses into your nice hotel? No. Uh, I've got, um, got 300 peasants outside. Can I bring those in too? No? Where can we park the horses? Um, in the stables. In the stables, round the back. <laughs> Nothing much changes in a few hundred years, does it? Can I come in on my own? I'm booked in for a cup of tea. I'm going to get a cup of tea. 600 years ago, the gatekeepers at the Savoy were on the peasants' side. They let them right in, thousands of them. Peasants, gentry, countrymen and Londoners. We've got the names of over 500. John Mocking, the wine merchant, was there. Along with the Manning Tree men, John Sumner and Robert Pierce. There were also lowlifes like Richard Scott, a street con man who'd scratched a living cheating gullible visitors to the capital with loaded dice. John and Joan Ferrer from Rochester liberated a chest containing a thousand pounds, rode it across the river to Southwark and shared it out with their mates. They'd taken a risk though. The rebels were prepared to use extreme violence in their fight against corruption, but looting was banned on pain of death. For them, raiding the Savoy wasn't about gain, it was a symbolic act of destruction. The rebels burnt Gaunt's clothes, smashed his furniture, cut up his silver and gold plates and threw them in the Thames. 
was a very nice tea, actually. They do do a good tea at the Savoy. I think one of the things that our experiments have shown is how different the world was in the Middle Ages. I've nicked you a bit of cake, by the way. Fantastic. From Thank you. how it is today. For instance, the kind of violence that they meted out in the Peasants' Revolt is unlike anything that there's been in London in my lifetime. They completely destroyed this place and left it in ruins for decades just to show people what a terrifying thing it was when the peasants revolted. Caroline, the old Savoy doesn't look nearly as grand round the back as it does from the front, does it? No, but I think perhaps in 1381, this side would have been quite as impressive as the front. So you've got loads of rioters here, not just people from Kent and Essex, but local people too. Would they have just left their work and mucked in? I'm quite sure the Londoners participated in the attack on the Savoy. They were obviously uh, opportunist, but they had their own reasons for disliking John of Gaunt. They disliked him because he had tried to extend the jurisdiction of the Crown and threaten the privileges of the City of London. Do you think this would have had any impact nationally, or was it just a London event? No, it had a massive impact nationally, and in Europe. I mean, it, it was well known all over Europe that this had happened. I think there's some very close parallels with 9-11 and the kind of impact that that had. But only two or three hundred people died here compared with thousands in 9-11. But think of the population of London. The population of London was perhaps 40,000. So two or three hundred people is about, you know, uh, one in 800. Whereas if you think of uh, New York, population of eight million, 2,000 die, that's perhaps one in 16,000. Massively greater death toll in the Peasants' Revolt in relation to the size of the population. People whom you perhaps disregarded and thought of as lower than vermin, uh, of no education, like animals, suddenly you find they're capable of organizing something on a massive scale and coordinating it and bringing about a successful breakdown of law and order. And I think after 9-11, everybody was shocked that people had been able to achieve such a coordinated impact. And it was exactly the same in 1381. The chroniclers are horrified that rustici, rustic people, are able to bring the king's government and the government of London to its knees. As the rebels took control of London, Richard II became a virtual prisoner in the tower. Looking out across the city, he would have seen columns of smoke rising from the Savoy Palace. So what would the atmosphere have been like here in London during the revolt? Well, if you were a lawyer or a priest, you'd probably have been hiding in a cupboard or under the floorboards. But for the ordinary people, it would have been very different. You know what it used to be like on a hot night during the Notting Hill Carnival in the old days? Everyone had had a good time and there was loads of rubbish all over the place and there were people lying face down in the street. But behind all the singing and laughter, there was an undercurrent of something much more violent and sinister. Some started to use the revolt as a cover to settle private grudges. It wasn't just corrupt officials that were hauled out for summary executions. One of the nastiest aspects of the revolt was a series of what nowadays we'd call racist attacks. The targets were the Belgians, or the Flemish as they were then known. What had they done wrong? Well, they were foreign and they made a lot of money and that was enough. The rioters would seek them out, they'd grab someone, throw them against a wall and get them to say the words bread and cheese. If they used the Flemish phrase, brot und kasse, that was proof. They were dragged away and their heads were cut off. After the first chaotic day in London that had seen the destruction of the Savoy Palace and summary executions on the street, the peasants had turned the world upside down. Hold up inside the tower, the king was presiding over a desperate debate about strategy. Some wanted to launch an immediate attack on the rebels. But Richard sided with those who counselled delaying tactics. 
he sent a message to the rebels. To determine the fate of his kingdom, the next day he would meet them face to face. England was in disarray. In just over two weeks, the Peasants' Revolt had shattered the rigid rules of medieval society. Peasants from Kent and Essex had overrun London and forced the King to agree to a face-to-face -face meeting. The Essex rebels camped here, a mile outside of London on the road to Essex, at a place appropriately called Mile End. There's the station over there. It was here on the 14th, only a fortnight after the revolt had started, that the King of England himself rode out to meet the rebels. It was confusing, scary. The King himself was under threat. He was Daniel in the lion's den. But was the royal party right to be so scared? Uh, they were. The, the threat was very serious indeed. Half of the country was involved with the Rising now. They were in very serious trouble and they knew it. So when they got here, what happened? Well, they approached the crowds. You have to bear in mind there's a huge uh, crowd. You had the Essex army here, about 30,000 peasants in the Essex army. The London population had turned out to join this enormous gathering. This is an extraordinary moment in English history. And what did they want? Um, they drawn up four demands. Um, one was for an end to bonded labour, which meant that the peasant would be able to work for any lord they, they chose to work for. So they wouldn't be serfs anymore? Exactly. That would be the end of serfdom. Yeah. Absolutely right. Uh, the second related demand was that uh, any peasant would be able to sell their produce as they chose on the London market or wherever. In other words, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be forced to hand over tribute to the local lord. So these are guys arguing for a free market, basically? Well, they certainly wanted the freedom to trade as, as they chose, yeah. that's right. And the third? The third demand uh, was for land rent to be reduced to four pence an acre. Now this is interesting because land rent varied enormously across England. Some peasants had to pay up to two shillings uh, a year per acre for their land. So to reduce that to four pence an acre across the country suggested they had a national plan, a national vision for how things could be different. This was a demand based on economic theory? Maybe theory is too strong a word, but they certainly had economic ideas. This wasn't some crazy chaotic outburst, some irrational outburst. They had an economic plan for how England could be organised differently. So that's three demands. The fourth demand was that nobody should be punished for having taken part in the Rising. So the King's confronted by all these radical demands. What does he do? He concedes. He knows he has no choice. They're really in a corner at this point. How did the rebels know he'd keep his word? They got it in writing. Uh, it's the same today, isn't it? You don't just take someone's word for it, you get it in writing. They demanded charters of freedom for every single village represented at Mile End that day. This was unbelievable. The king had granted every one of the peasants' demands. At a stroke, he'd agreed to dismantle the entire structure of medieval society, ending serfdom and producing signed documents to make it official. And this is the evidence, a contemporary copy of one of the charters recorded by a chronicler. In trying to hang on to his kingdom, Richard was willing to sacrifice almost anything and anyone. The rebels thought they'd got what they wanted, but the hated government officials were still in power. So they demanded the heads of Sudbury and Hales, who'd been left behind at the tower. And when the king murmured something about giving them justice, a group of them broke away, Tower of London please, and raced back to London with the news that the King was throwing the traitors to the wolves. London had never once fallen in its entire history, but this time it was different. When the rebels arrived, they found the drawbridge was down and the doors were open. The king, or someone close to him, was clearly on their side. On one level, they were like kids let loose in a sweet shop, 
They rampaged through the corridors. They burst into the Queen's bedroom. They ransacked her drawers. They bounced up and down on her bed. But that was just the fun part. They knew what they were really after, the blood of the poll tax traitors. Sudbury and Hales and co. must have known what was coming to them as this great crowd of men and women swept through the tower. Sudbury tried to escape, but he was spotted by a woman as he scrambled into a boat and was dragged away and thrown into this chapel. The country's number one bishop and tax collector had got nothing left to do but pray. It took eight blows to sever Sudbury's head from his body. Robert Hales was also executed. Their heads were paraded on spikes in celebration of the peasants' total victory. After just two weeks of rebellion, the peasants had overturned medieval society. They'd won their freedom and seen their hated enemies executed in cold blood. They trusted Richard to deliver. So even while the newly won charters of freedom were being signed, satisfied peasants started drifting back to their homes. If Richard's concessions had been intended to divide and rule, the tactic had worked. Down this little alleyway is the site of Richard II's bolt hole, a fortified house in the city walls known as the wardrobe. It was here on the night of the 14th that a special team of 30 monks was drafted in to copy out the royal charters of freedom. But the amazing gains made at Mile End weren't enough for a hard core of Kentish rebels led by Watt Tyler. Their ambition was nothing less than the overthrow of the entire system. And the next day, a final showdown between the roofer from Maidstone and the boy King would shape England's destiny for centuries. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, there was this extraordinary feeling of excitement and euphoria that ordinary people had overthrown a superpower. Something similar must have been in the air in June 1381. In just two weeks, the peasantry had thrown this rigid and oppressive regime into total disarray. The king had given in to all their demands. Not only that, but they'd got bits of paper to prove it. Royal charters actually signed by the king, which promised to do away with serfdom. Not only that, but he'd sacrificed the heads of some of the most hated and highest officials in the land just to appease their anger. The status quo had been stretched to breaking point. When news reached the authorities that Watt Tyler wanted further concessions, they must have realized a showdown with the hardcore rebels was inevitable. They had to come up with a strategy. Their plan to fight back all rested on the shoulders of a 14-year-old boy. Richard II knew he was going to need all the help he could get. At 3 o'clock on the 15th, the deeply religious young king came here to Westminster Abbey to pray at the shrine of his venerable ancestor, the saint and king Edward the Confessor. He'd only have had the haziest idea of how badly his kingdom was falling apart. But what he did know was that for him, the next six hours were make or break. He had one trump card to play. The peasants absolutely trusted Richard to do the right thing by them. They were wrong. The crunch meeting was make or break for both sides. It was arranged for later that day, here on neutral ground outside the city walls. In 1381, it was a field by the monastery and hospital of St. Bartholomew, Smithfield. Smithfield Meat Market grew up here outside the city walls. No one wanted the dirty business of butchery in the heart of the city. And Smithfield 
was also a place for dirty political deeds. A few years before, William Wallace, Braveheart, had been hung, drawn and quartered here. On the 15th, death was once again in the air. The peasants started to assemble late in the afternoon. They knew that the political future of England was theirs to grasp. The demonstrations I've been on in London have all tended to start pretty much the same. First of all, little rather desultory groups of people arrived looking round, wondering what's going to happen, and then more and more people fill the square, until suddenly there's a sense that you actually occupy the place in a way that you never have before. Then someone arrives with all the banners and posters, and all of a sudden you've got an identity but presumably they didn't have banners and posters in the 14th century. Well, I think there's evidence that's suggesting they did. I in what way? Modern academics are suggesting that they found evidence they're carrying the St George's flag and that Richard, to indicate his assent to this, had given some of them permission to carry the royal standard. <laughs> The peasants may have had their 14th century equivalent of placards, but that's as far as the parallel with the demonstration goes. They were a far more formidable fighting force than a bunch of modern protesters. They had to be. Richard's men had state-of-the-art equipment. This guy would have been a bit more threatening than a yeah. copper in a riot shield, wouldn't he? Absolutely. So the status quo guard, and we're 35 years into the Hundred Years' War. These are men with real military experience. So, a man clad in steel is an intimidating thing. So what kind of weapons would the King's forces have had? The predominant weapon of the period, of course, is the sword. Yes. So they'd have been armed with a sword. The sword can be used, obviously, to cut. You can thrust with, which you can cut with. You can use the other end as a hammer. You can use the cross guard as a hook. It's a very versatile fighting tool. They also would have had daggers. Daggers would be on both sides. Daggers are wonderfully versatile weapon. Again, great somewhere like London, good for street fighting. Getting close, stab people in the shoulder, which has a particular resonance in this circumstance. Yeah, but with this armour and the sword, surely the, the rebels would have easily been hammered. Well, I think the important thing to remember with this rebellion is this was an armed rebellion. And in London, there were two opposing forces heavily armed. There was no inequality here. So what did the rebels have? Well, they had a variety of things. Obviously, they weren't all peasants in, in the way that people today think they were. But even if some of them were, the poorest man in the land can afford a stick. You can get a stick for free in the woods. Is that much good, though? Yeah. I could beat a man in armour with a stick. Never. First of all, I've got reach. His main job, he's going to get near me. I could have hit him 20 times then. If he's clever enough to get hold of my stick and comes in, I can use the stick to block with. Now I've got a wonderful lever. He's off balance and I can hit him and hit him again. So a stick is very useful. But even if you're not a skilled person with a stick, even if you're somebody who hasn't done much but just has anger in your heart, you could do a lot of damage with that. Oh, I think that's for me. That one's for me. Yeah, I like that. What about this? This is quite Simple fierce, isn't it? agricultural tool. It's called a hedging bill. It's for trimming the hedges, laying the hedges, getting them neat. It's a weapon in its own right. But pop down to your local blacksmith and get him to spend ten minutes in the forge and put a spike on it. And you can see, look, it's the same tool. This is like the yeoman of the guard use nowadays. Exactly. Isn't it? This, with a spike on, becomes the English military bill. And it was a classic weapon of the Hundred Years' War. English billmen were famed the world over. And it's got reach. You can get to people on horseback. It's got power. Even simpler, you just need to take a scythe blade. So a scythe for reaping the corn down to the blacksmith and put it on a long pole. Now you've got a devastating, awesome cutting weapon. So you've got the reach to scythe up at that night, sitting six foot high over his horse. Or chop the horse. What's this thing? It's a... Well, I have to say, this does look a bit Joey. <laughs> Joey, <laughs> it's a flail. It's you've seen Bruce Lee movies, yeah, and they have the nunchuckers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Two yeah. little short sticks, yeah, and they do all that stuff and do all the yeah, things like yeah. that. 
that's because they use it to thresh the rice. What they did in Europe was they used this with a longer pole to thresh the wheat. So again, we're a few weeks away from harvest, the wheat is still green, but once that's golden brown, you need to thresh it, you need to separate the wheat from the chaff. So it's simply a tool that they do that on the floor to separate the wheat from the chaff. Stick some nails in it and you've got a military weapon. <laughs> me, I wouldn't like to be on the receiving end of that. No, and even if you're wearing armour, then there's going to be a level where you get some blunt trauma. Well, let's have a go at that. And adding to this homegrown arsenal was the deadly firepower of the people's weapon, the longbow. 900 bows had been stolen from the tower the day before, and every peasant was trained to use one. So we've got two opposing armies bristling with weapons, nose to nose in the middle of London. Pretty scary thought. Well, it's not quite in the middle of London, Tony. It's right on the outer edge of the city. Uh, even now, today, it's right by the ring of steel that marks the sensitive inner core of the city. Well, it's more like a ring of solid plastic now, but I know what you yeah, mean. Yeah, but in 1381, it would have also been still very dramatic from the events of the revolt. Behind us, you'd have been able to see the ruins of one of the priories that the rebels had attacked still burning away. So why here? I think because it was a controlled space where you could easily assemble um, the two sides in order to try and conduct some sort of negotiation. How many rebels do you think there might have been? Well, it's always difficult to say with numbers in 1381. We know that some rebels had left the city after the concessions at Mile End, um, but um, what we were left with uh, at Smithfield um, was a recalcitrant, hardcore, almost like headbanging, headbangers rebels. Um, I guess there probably would be about three or four hundred uh, of them left by that stage. And King's men? Well, the King is likely to have had about 200 men with him, including bodyguards and his personal servants and his attendants. So they're, they're really getting prepared for this encounter and probably quite concerned at this stage. When you say prepared, what do you reckon their plan was? Well, it's very difficult to work out, but it seems that there's some suggestion that the King's men might have expected some kind of trouble and may well have been planning for an armed encounter. Otherwise, they're probably concerned to see what Tyler is actually going to ask for at this second meeting. So do you reckon the whole thing was actually a stitch-up? Well, many people have said that. Right, uh, really, since the few days after the revolt, people have argued that this occasion may well have been set up as a sting against Tyler and the other rebels. And what's your thought? Uh, it's so difficult to tell, but one problem with this theory is that the king is quite exposed throughout the encounter, and his life really is in danger at several points. It's a real high-risk strategy. Um, if, the, if it was a plot, if it was a conspiracy, uh, they're taking an enormous risk, especially as they must have been aware that they were dealing with the toughest and the most recalcitrant of the rebels by that Could have stage. been cock-up just as much as conspiracy. Uh, it may well have been that, yeah. This illustration is from Jean Frozart's History of the Revolt, written just seven years after the event. It's the climactic showdown between Richard II and Watt Tyler. There's a complete hush. It's really tense. The archers have got their fingers on the bows, but Watt ambles up to the king in a familiar, relaxed way, shakes him by the hand, hello, brother, he says, and then he tells him what they want. Freedom? Abolition of the aristocracy, apart from the king. Abolition of the senior clergy, except for John Ball, who was going to be made the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Local courts, local police forces to be run by the people themselves. And all the money that previously belonged to the bishops and the lords would now be divided up among the common people. And all the while, what was telling this to the king, he was playing with his knife, flicking it from hand to hand. Although, whether it was because he was tense or because he was really relaxed, no one knows. When he'd finished, the king didn't argue or try to negotiate. He just said yes, with the tiny caveat that the people should continue to respect the monarchy. What was thirsty? He called for some water. He took a drink, swirled it round in his mouth, and spat it out. Then he ordered some beer. He drank that and wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. And at that moment, when they seemed to be on the verge of the greatest social revolution the world had ever known, things started to unravel. Oi! shouted a squire near the king. I know you. You're the biggest thief in Kent. <laughs> 
That narked what? He said, come here and say that. And he ordered his men to lop off the squire's head. But no one moved. Instead, the mayor of London rode forward, either to reason with Tyler or to provoke him. The chronicles differ as to precisely what happened next, but what is clear is that some kind of scuffle broke out. Watts tried to stab the mayor, but he was wearing armour and stabbed Watts in the back of the neck instead. Then someone else whacked him. Watts tried to ride back to the safety of his men, but before he'd got 80 paces, he fell off his horse. The peasant bowmen tensed, ready to rain down arrows on the king and his men. Behind them were others with flails and bill hooks. There was enough firepower to wipe out the entire bodyguard. Even the king himself was in danger. But on the brink of disaster, Richard himself dealt the fatal blow to the peasants' revolt. He was only 14, but he was brave. He rode straight towards the sea of rebel bowmen. You shall have no other king but me, he shouted. Follow me to Clerkenwell. It seems that he was being spontaneous. If so, it was very brave, but it was also a brilliantly ambiguous phrase. Did he mean that he was taking the rebels' cause, or was he telling them that from now on they had to submit to the authorities? The peasants lowered their bows, breathed a sigh of relief, and followed their king to the fields of Clerkenwell. All through the revolt, they'd appealed to him for justice. Now their fate, and that of the wounded Wat Tyler, lay in his hands. Surely the divinely appointed monarch would see them right. Wat Tyler's outrageous demands for a new social order had led to a bloody confrontation at Smithfield. Now, the peasants' revolt hung in the balance. Richard II led the remaining rebels off to the fields of Clerkenwell on the promise that he would be their new leader. Meanwhile, Tyler himself was bleeding to death here in the Abbey of St Bartholomew's. He'd been dragged here after he'd been stabbed. The monks were trying to keep him alive when the king's men burst in and dragged him outside for a show execution. They severed his head from his body and with that blow, the revolution ended. They stuck the head on a spike and took it off to the fields of Clerkenwell where the king had led the rebels. But at the same time, all the available loyal forces in every ward in London converged on Clerkenwell and surrounded them. When they saw Tyler's head and the show of force, the rebels threw away their weapons and dropped to their knees in the corn, begging forgiveness. The rebels had come within an inch of transforming the country. But with Wat Tyler's death, the momentum of the revolt was broken. And as the shock waves of failure spread, the rebellion slowly died. Richard had never been on the peasant's side. He organized a ferocious backlash. The people of England were about to find out the price of revolution in the 14th century. The establishment wanted to make sure nothing like this ever happened again. After the disaster at Smithfield, thousands of rebels went home, hopeful that they wouldn't be identified. But a small corps clung on as outlaws. In the Middle Ages, if you were an outlaw, then like Robin Hood, you tended to hide in the forests. And 500 of them were cornered in the woods of Billericay and massacred. Then the king appointed commissioners to seek out and destroy the leaders of the rebels who'd returned home. They were to be punished, said the king, either according to the laws of the Kingdom of England or else by other means and methods, by beheading, by mutilation of limbs, as seems to you both expeditious and sensible.
The Billericay deaths were just part of a campaign of terror that shocked even the chroniclers of the time. Scholars estimate that hundreds died before official prosecutions began. And what about the individuals whose stories we've been following? Wat Tyler was probably already dead from his wounds when he was beheaded. John Ball suffered the full torture of being hung, drawn and quartered some months later. He died still proclaiming his simple faith. Many wealthier rebels like John Mocking the wine dealer, Thomas Raven the MP and the men from Manningtree were pardoned and lived out lives of respectability. Unlike Thomas Wooden, the army deserter, he denied his part in the revolt and staked his life on a trial by combat. He lost. Then there was Richard Scott. He ended up in the pillory the next year, not for taking part in the revolt, but for cheating two Scotsmen at dice. And the man who started it all, Thomas the Baker, was hunted down. On the 4th of July, just a month after he sparked the revolt, he too was hung, drawn and quartered. Over the next five months, the last embers of the peasants' revolt were extinguished. But the authorities not only wanted the peasants defeated, they wanted the rebellion forgotten. Official spin started the process of masking the true nature and achievements of the summer of 1381. This is Sudbury in Suffolk, which seems to me to be the perfect place to end this journey because despite the official pardons, the period after the revolt saw a vicious bloodbath of unofficial executions without trial. They weren't recorded, of course, so we've no idea how many. But in the 1930s, a whole cache of headless skeletons was found just over there. And local people believe they're the bodies of the last remnants of the rebels. They were reburied, of course, covered up, just like the true story of the Peasants' Revolt. This church was once the heart of an institution founded by Simon Sudbury, the hated archbishop who'd enforced the poll tax. His head had been hacked off by the rebels at the Tower of London. We know that the summer of 1381 was gloriously hot, but if you want proof of the fact, it's here. Sudbury's supporters rescued his head from the spike on which the rebels had stuck it, and brought it back to this church. It's in this little cupboard here. There you go. Can you see that the air was so hot and dry that it actually mummified all the skin on the lower half of his skull? That is the head of the man who collected the very first poll tax. It was this that was paraded round on a spike on the 14th of June, 1381. And there you can see the sword marks where his head was hacked from his neck. It's quite a bizarre historical relic and it's just about the only tangible thing. It's quite a bizarre historical relic and it's just about the only tangible thing I can show you from the Peasants' Revolt. There's no shrine for any one of the men and women who came so close to changing their world. So was the Peasants' Revolt just a blip on history's radar? Did so many people die for nothing? Or is there a more lasting legacy from 1381? The global impact of the Peasants' Revolt showed that ordinary people could get together and think about politics on a broader level beyond their own lives. Since 1381, no British government, and nowadays that means the House of Commons, the House of Lords, but then it meant the King and his Council and Parliament, 
can disregard the wider political community. And for this to have happened at the end of the 14th century was truly remarkable. It set the pattern for later centuries of revolt. We find more of them in the 15th century, in the 16th century and beyond. There's a real sense, I think, that in 1381, the peasantry has arrived as a factor in politics. People today are protesting against uh, exploitation and warfare. So what the peasants did in 1381 does echo down the centuries to us, and it does have a resonance in terms of our own experience today. My search for the truth about the peasants' revolt has given me an entirely new perspective on the Middle Ages. All right, they were tough and horrible for the majority of ordinary people who were trapped inside this tyrannical and oppressive regime. But we're not talking about brain-dead yokels like something out of a Monty Python film. These are smart, politically sophisticated people separated from us by just a sliver of historical time. And what I find really moving is the way that they were able to express really complex desires and demands about things like religion and tax and local government and freedom and weld them all together into a really well-crafted manifesto. Not only that, but many of them were prepared to risk prosecution and death even though they weren't directly involved. They lost, of course. But what they did sent a clarion call down the ages that's never been completely forgotten. That in the end, government can only work if the people are prepared to be governed.